Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we come tonight, Lord God, to spend some time with you in the word. We pray, Lord God, for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be with us tonight. We pray that you would give us an ear to hear, a heart to understand, and a will to obey you. We pray for the anointing, Lord, to be on the teacher and the hearers. We pray that the Holy Spirit would facilitate all that we say and we do tonight. Help us to understand, Lord, what your word is saying. And more than that, help us to apply it to our lives, Lord God. Because truly, we want to be your servants. We want to be your people. We want to be lights that shine in the world. We pray that you get all the glory out of what we do and say in this room tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So been a while since we've been together and we are still yet in the book of Acts. Um, we are in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts and um, we've been looking at Saul when he was leaving Jerusalem to go to Damascus. You remember we call it the, his Damascus Road experience and uh, He's on his way to Damascus from Jerusalem with these letters that says he can go get these people who he feels are, you know, perverting their religion and the law of Moses, these, this new sect of folk that's following this Jesus. And so in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, we find that after Stephen's death, Saul was you know, central to that. He was there. He witnessed it. They laid down Stephen's clothes at his feet. And uh, he's wanting to persecute Christians even more. So he gets letters from the Sanhedrin to take to, uh, thank you, sweetie, to take to Damascus and to find any people who are of the way, the way of Christianity, the way of following Jesus, that the letters will give him permission with the other synagogue leaders and stuff to let them know he come to take these people back and, uh, you know, cause them to be bound, put in prison, whether they're men or women. And I wonder, I say, wow, if uh, we had to go to prison today for following Jesus Christ, <clears throat> Would we follow? Would we be loyal to Jesus? Or, you know, would we have an issue? And so you remember the story while he's on his way there, uh, a voice calls him from heaven, a light shines out and says, why are you persecuting me? Calls him by name. Who want the Lord to just single him out in the crowd and call him by their name? Like when your mother call you your whole name. Your whole name. You already know she calling your whole government. You in trouble. And 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 so Saul knew that too. And he said, "Why are you persecuting me?" And he was like, "Well, you know, what do you mean? Who are you?" And uh, the Lord identifies Himself and says, "He's Jesus." And I love it. He says, "I am Jesus." He uses the title of God for Himself, the I Am. And um, so he thought that he was just persecuting some heretics and then he finds out that he is persecuting the very God. Isn't that something? Amen. You think you uh, messing with folk and then you find out that you messing with God because you're messing with his people? Wow. Right. Woo, you don't want to do that. Okay. You don't want to do that. And then of course there were people who were traveling with him. They saw the light and they heard something but it, they didn't really understand what the voice was saying probably sounded like thunder. You know, we were saying how old folks used to say if it was thunder and lightning, they would say, go somewhere and sit down mm -hmm. and be quiet because God is talking. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we get around uh, Acts 9, around verse 9, after he uh, is struck down, he falls down, and when he gets up, he's blinded. Mm -hmm. And so for three days, he goes on into Damascus, but he can't see anything. He can't see anything. They had to lead him by the hand, and he didn't eat or he didn't drink. He is fasting, um, trying to figure out what 
is going to occur next in his life because the Lord told him, go ahead, and then I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next to you. So we pick up our text uh, tonight. Let's pick up Acts chapter 9, and let's uh, start at verse number 10 through 12. We might have done this last time, but we're going to start right there. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 12, because this is in the meanwhile, while... Saul is over there fasting and not uh, knowing what's going to happen. Something else is happening in the background, in the meanwhile. So all the time when you're going through stuff and you don't see God's hand, doesn't mean that God ain't moving. Amen? Okay, so Acts 9, verses nine through tw uh, 10 through 12. Anybody want to read that? And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tyrus. For behold, he prayeth, and having seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Okay, so while Saul is there in the dark, so to speak, God is moving with this other disciple, this other follower, this other Christian, this other devout Jew named Ananias. He was a believer in Jesus Christ. So while uh, Saul was trying to get folks and take them to prison, obviously others were preaching the gospel and uh, letting folk know and the things that happened in Jerusalem was spreading you know all over the place and others were beginning to believe uh, in Jesus Christ and Ananias was one of them and but Saul's reputation had preceded him and so everybody kind of knew about Saul you know kind of like John Gotti you know <laughs> if Gotti was looking for you you was in trouble <laughs> So Saul was, uh, his reputation had preceded him, and so God speaks to Ananias, gives him these instructions to go and see about Saul. And he, he makes it specific so that he doesn't confuse the Saul that he wants him to go, because it was a very common name. Saul was a common name at that time because it was the name of the first king. And uh, many people would, would use that name. You know how we do today. We like to name our kids after famous people and, you know, important people and stuff like that. So he makes it clear that he wants him to go see this particular Saul who's staying with Judas on Straight Street. And he's the one from Tarsus, not just any old Saul. And he's praying. So, um... It, he, he tells him the street because, you know, like they ain't have street lights and GPS. So he had to give him the markers and tell him, you know, obviously straight street was familiar to Ananias who lived in that uh, area of Damascus. So he knew exactly where to go. And uh, he know what the Lord is saying. So, and, and I love it because he obviously recognizes the voice of God, right? Isn't it good when the Lord's speaking to you and you know it's him? Mm -hmm. You know, or when he tell you something, you, you don't have to say, is that you, God? Because <laughs> you've gotten so familiar with his voice that when he does lead you or he does say something to you, you know it's him. And so Ananias knew it was him. And then God gives him further uh, details. He says, you know, this guy has had a vision. So while he was in the dark, while he could not see, Saul was still in communication with God and God was in communication with him and he gave him a vision. What is a vision? Anybody? Uh, it's seeing something. It is. Say again. It's like a prophecy. It's like a prophecy. That's right. It usually, if God is showing you, then it, it, it is prophetic, right? And it's kind of like a daytime dream. You're a vision, you're usually awake. Whereas a dream, you're asleep. But they're both, if God is in it and showing you something, it, both of them come from God. And if you've ever had a vision, you are normally awake. And it's, it's like it's real. It's like reality. So he's saying he's had a vision. He's seen you, Ananias. He's seen you 
coming to him and putting your hands on him so that he can uh, have his sight restored. Now, Ananias doesn't know what happened to Saul on his way to Damascus. He don't know he's somewhere blind. He don't know he fasted. He don't know all he has is this instruction from God about this man who was a persecutor and a killer. Right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and uh, he, he says, go and put your hands on him. So laying on of hands is something that God has used um, for a long time. This isn't new, you know. Um, and it doesn't mean that Ananias' hands per se had power in them. Our hands only have anything. Our voices only have anything if God is on it. Amen. If God's not on it and in it, you can touch something all day long and nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. yep. Amen? And I, I always like to say that faith is in the revealed word of God. It's not in the presumed word of God or the I wish word of God. It is in the word of God that he speaks to you for the rhema for that moment then. Amen? Because what God can do, he can always do. But he don't necessarily do what he can do all of the time. And just because you say it doesn't mean that God going to do it right, right then. Right, right, right. Amen? Amen? So he tells Ananias to go. And so then, let's look at verse 13 and 14. Acts 9, verse 13 and 14, somebody. The Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. Mm. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Mm. So now God then told Ananias what to do. He's a follower, he's a disciple, he's a believer, right? He is available to do God's will. But he wasn't so anxious to obey this particular thing that God told him to do. God ever tell you something to do and you're not necessarily, you know, just anxious to do it, running to do it, particularly if it's, uh, you know, something about somebody that done, you know, hurt you or her. You need to forgive them or you need to bless them in some way. And God is telling you what to do. Sometimes you're not that anxious, even though God already told Ananias that Saul was doing what? Praying. praying. He's praying. He's not looking for folks and he's not trying to imprison people. He's praying. And the, and the prayer here is for uh, Ananias to know that the Holy Spirit's working. Mm. The Holy Spirit's working with Saul. He's, he's dealing with his heart. And so, um, instead of just trusting what God said, because he knew it was God's voice, he started trying to say, um, I know what you said. I know who you're talking about, but I, I like how he says, I've heard a whole bunch of stuff about this guy, Lord. You know, as if, well, did you hear it, Lord? <laughs> Do you know everything, you know? He says, and, and, and he, he came, you know, he did some terrible things to the saints in, in Jerusalem. That was awful. But now he has come here with the authority and the power to do the same thing, you know. And maybe Ananias had, you know, heard about these letters from the Christians uh, in Jerusalem. Maybe they showed up. Maybe they was running away or, or whatever have you. Because when Stephen was persecuted and stoned, many people scattered, remember? Mm -hmm. So so Ananias first argued with the Lord and gave him some good reasons why he shouldn't have to do what God said do. <laughs> you ever just say, well, Lord, you know, try to give him some, some reasons why, you know, you shouldn't have to do it. I have a stammering tongue. I don't like them. They don't like me. I've been in trouble. I got warrants. <laughs> you know, I can't go. You know, but Ananias had to obey God. Right? And, and, and obedience is always by faith too. Amen? It takes faith to obey God. Particularly if it's not something you just jumping to do from the beginning, but you know God said it. Amen? And so when, when God is telling us something, what we have to remember is that God is working over here and God is working over here. And he let Ananias know that he was 
working on both hands because he said Saul is praying, which means that God knew that he was aware and that he was praying. And when you're really praying, you're talking to God and God talking to you. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. So he's praying and God gave him a vision. All right, so Ananias is really not trying to do it. You know. So Acts 9, verses 15 and 16, somebody. Oh my goodness. So when Ananias started rattling, you know, rattling off his reasons, did God deal with any of them? <laughs> he said he didn't say, Well, yeah, I know, and here's this about that. He he didn't, right? <laughs> what what did he do? He said, Go. Anyway. It was a command. It was an imperative. And, and all the things that Ananias said about Saul, the only response God gave to him about him was what? Go. He's a chosen vessel. Mm -hmm. Now, if you Ananias, you know, you might be saying, how in the world <laughs> is this persecuting, murdering dude going to be the chosen instrument, the chosen vessel of God. But you know what? People can look at you and me. Uh -huh. Ask the same question. How you get to be a preacher? I don't believe she got to be a preacher. Anybody who knows me from before could certainly say that, and I would say it with them. Hey. Uh -huh. My daddy said, you could have fooled me. I didn't think so either. <laughs> but God is God. And he changes everything. And I love it because this chosen it is choice. It is selected. It, it is good. It is means I picked him out. It is God's grace. He didn't choose God. God chose him. Yes. Don't you love it? Yes. He chooses you before you even know him. He chooses you. He chose Saul before Saul chose Jesus. And we know that because he didn't even know who the man was that was talking to him from heaven. Jesus. And, and so can you imagine he probably felt so unworthy. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was going to do. You know, and, he's, and, 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 and God says, I've chosen him with a particular mission. And his mission was not to the Jews, right? Who was it to? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. His mission was to the Gentiles, because you, if you remember anything about his lineage, he was born with Roman citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. And he was a Jew. Mm -hmm. So he had this dual citizenship on earth, and he was learned, and he was trained. So he was perfect for the mission that God had. Mm -hmm. God would work in him to fulfill his purpose. Sometimes the crazy stuff you've been through God uses it as a part of his plan and his purpose. Amen. I am a witness. <laughs> I am a witness. And some of it has made you uniquely uh, prepared for what God has for you. So sometimes our past, while we don't live in it, has prepared us for our present and our future. Amen? Amen. And God's name is still going to get the glory mm -hmm. out of everything that's going to happen in Saul's life. And then he ends up with that last line. That probably is what did it for Ananias. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show him. I'm going to show him a thing or two. <laughs> How much he's going to have to suffer for my name. Oh. You know. Oh, all right then. <laughs> Suffering was a part of Saul's call. And I don't think it was just because he was a persecutor. I think because he was chosen and fitted for this purpose and he was someone who would make it through the suffering. You know, everybody can't make it through their suffering mm -hmm. in, in, in a way where they come out victorious. You feel me? You're going to make it through one way or another. Mm -hmm. You know, either victorious or down, depressed and whatever. Mm -hmm. You're going to get through it. But this how many things, he don't say, you know, like a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to suffer a little. 
you know, suffer a little while. He says, the many things, it's many degrees of suffering that Saul was going to have to go through. But it was the gift of Christ to him. This suffering was gifting to him because it was going to be a blessing to so many others. Sometimes what you go through is not for you. Sometimes it's for other people. Amen? Amen. Okay, so Acts 9, 17 to 19. Let's go. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. Hmm. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight hmm. and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. <laughs> And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Mm -hmm. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Okay. So now Ananias is convinced. Okay. God didn't, didn't deal with my fears, but he told me that this is a chosen vessel. So I don't have to be afraid. I know that I'm doing what God wants me to do. And I love it. He's convinced. He loses no time. He just goes straight to the house of Judas. And he does exactly what God told him to do. He go in the house. As soon as he get in there, he puts his hands on Saul. <laughs> don't you love it? He don't say, hey, is you Saul? You know, he knew exactly who he was. And then I like it because he ministers to Saul. What is the first thing he says to him? Brother. 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 Come on. Yeah. Brother. He calls him brother. Now, you're Saul. You're there. You're blind. You, you, you done just met Jesus. The light of God has blinded you. And you're, you're there. You haven't eaten. You're weak. You're tired. You just don't even know what to do with yourself because of who you were. Right? Have you ever been so bad that you just don't even think God could love you? Yeah, yeah. You know? And this man comes in and the first thing he does is calls him brother. What kind of joy that had to bring to Saul. And it also tells us something about Ananias, right? What? What does it tell us about Ananias? The power of Christ. That what does it tell us about Ananias, though? Obedient. He's obedient? Yeah. What else? But I mean, he calls him brother. He accepts. He brings him in. He says, you're connected to us now. You are our brother. You're my brother. So all of Ananias' suspicion was erased. And he takes Saul to his heart as a brother in Christ. That's only because of he's a follower of Christ. He believes God. God says, I chose him. And this is the grace of God to Saul from Ananias. And he, so he's letting Saul know you are fully included in the fellowship of the church. Come on in. Yeah. That ought to teach us something. Yeah. Right? Folks, we don't need to be leaving people on the, on the outside or at the door or in the hallway. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Full inclusion. And God can use Hidden saints, because probably didn't people know about Ananias. I don't know, or maybe he was important. I don't know. But God can use hidden saints to move in the lives of the most important people. And I am certain that if you ask certain uh, big-time pillars in the church right now, you'll find that there were some who were, you know, small people, unbeknownst, maybe never even seen them again, that God used in their lives, and you could be that person too. That's why it's important that when you meet people and talk with people, you leave them with a blessing. You leave them with a good word. You leave them with a good seed, whether they look like they want it or not. Amen? So um, God keeps the books. He sees what you're doing. He knows if you bless somebody or not, and we don't have to be afraid to obey God's instructions. If God tells you what to do, then do it. Because Saul heard Ananias' voice and he felt his hands. And by that interaction, God's power filled the room. And we know it because what happened to his eyes? 
his eyes were opened. And, and he says, God sent me, and he wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. He lays his hands on him. God gives an endowment of power to this form of persecutor, to this murderer. God gives his power of his spirit to him. Same spirit that came on the day of Pentecost to all the followers. Saul got it too. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. <laughs> It's an anointing, yes, sis. I love that word immediately. Mm-hmm. When, when, when it says immediately, um, it's like the something like uh, It was radical. It's like, yeah. It was a radical transformation. Right there, right there. God can do it <laughs> in an instant. Amen? Mm -hmm. And I like this 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 thing, something like scales. It's like um Remember uh, um, Luke, who's, who's writing Acts, was a physician, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like a, a technical medical term that he's using in scales. It's like the, the, uh, what we would think of, uh, of an incrustation right over the whole front of his eyes. Mm -hmm. It's like skin and particles from diseased parts of the body was over his eyes, but when Ananias put his hands on the bloom. They fell. Mm. All. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Woo! I love it. And then it says, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. God's power came into him because every single one of us have to have the Holy Spirit on the inside so we can live for God. Amen. You cannot live for the Lord in your own strength, your own willpower. I know because I tried. I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to live for God. Not saved or nothing, but, you know, I'm going to just turn over a new leaf. I'm going to live right. <laughs> yeah, that was about a week, you know, maybe two at the outside. And then I was right back to the same old thing until I came to the altar and fell on my knees and the scales fell and the power of God came. Then I was changed. So it says he got up and he was baptized. So he was filled with the Spirit and then he was baptized. So you don't have to get baptized in order to be filled with the Spirit. Nor do you necessarily have to have hands laid on you. The Spirit of God comes into you the moment you say, I want Jesus. I want him to come into my heart and fill me. He comes. If you don't speak in tongues, that does not mean you do not have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. Nobody can live for Christ without his spirit. You have to have him. How the spirit may manifest in you is up to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Okay. The baptism is a symbol of his new life in Jesus Christ. But it was not a requirement of his salvation. Amen? Amen? But he wanted to be identified with the Lord. He needed to be identified with the Lord. Those of us that have been chief Christian, chief uh, sinners, we need to get baptized and the world need to know it. Because we're making an identification. And so there was water probably right near Judas's house. Today, where they think his house was, this man on Straight Street, there was water right there in Damascus, still is. And so they probably baptized him right there. Um, the Holy Spirit baptism and water baptism all went right on at the same time. So it wasn't necessary for him to be baptized to be saved, you know, but God orchestrated all things well because Jesus didn't have to be baptized either, right? But he was leading the way by example for all of us. And so, yes, we should be baptized. We should, but it's not a requirement of salvation, it won't save you. <laughs> it identifies you, but it certainly won't save you. And so um, he got up, he got uh, baptized because of he was a believer, and he's trusting God, and he's calling on Christ. He was saved before he went in the water. Amen? And so then after that, it says he takes some food and regains his strength. He ate. It was three days he didn't eat or drink. 
Now he's saved, he's baptized, he's filled with the spirit, and now he eats some food. Can you imagine three days without eating or drinking in addition to having that shocking experience mm -hmm. on the road? Shocking. Exposed to the resurrected Christ who's in heaven. Do you know what that means for a Jew to know that that man, Jesus, is in heaven? Come on, we, 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 we take it like, oh yeah, Jesus in heaven, seated at the right hand of God. Yeah, but for a Jew, that was a new thing. That was radical. This same man that they crucified is now in heaven, seated next to his father, making him very God. He know he done met the Messiah. Amen? So he's getting strength. He's encountered uh, Ananias. He's got healing. He's got filling with the spirit. He's got his baptism. Now he's eating and he's chilling with the disciples in Damascus. He came there to kill him. Now you're just chilling with them. Maybe learning from them, I'm sure. Because while he was a very learned man, he didn't know a whole lot about Jesus. Because he didn't spend any time with him. Amen? Mm -hmm. And he probably discovered that these people were some loving people. Mm -hmm. True disciples are loving. Mm -hmm. True disciples are not mean and arrogant. Mm -hmm. And conceited. And up and you down. Mm -hmm. No. And he probably figures out these people did not deserve what I was trying to do. Can you imagine? <laughs> the persecution he came to try to inflict on them, I'm sure he recognized they did not deserve it. All they wanted to do was share the truth about Christ, the truth of God, and to share it with others. And here he was not knowing it. And now he gets it. And he was like, oh my goodness, I was trying to kill those who had the truth about Jesus. Okay, Acts 9, verse 20 to 22. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue. And then, then was Saul certain days with, with his disciples which were in Damascus. And straightway He would go to the temple. He would go to the colonnade. He would go 
where the Jews gathered and he would preach about the word of God. So Saul now is turning into a Christian preacher and he's preaching Jesus that he's the son of God because to them the son of God meant Messiah. They knew what he was trying to say. The son of God means that you're in the Davidic line. You're a king. You special. So he is making sure that they know that Jesus, by his personal name, Jesus, he's establishing or connecting the identity of the man Jesus with the divine Messiah. He makes that connection for them. Because none of them believed it when Jesus walked the earth. He was one of the ones that didn't believe it either. And I'm sure without the Damascus Road experience, he still wouldn't be believing it. But because he was chosen, he was the one to go right straight to the synagogue and start proclaiming his faith in Christ right in them places where he was trying to look for folks and arrest them, he is professing, I'm one of you now. I'm one of you. And he is boldly calling Jesus the son of God. So that means that from the very beginning of when he got saved, he acknowledges that Jesus is God. He acknowledges the deity of Jesus the man, connects him with Christ, which means the Messiah. The one we've been looking for, this is him, y'all. Amen? This is what he tells us. That's why verse 21 said, everybody who heard what he said was what? Amen. They was astonished. What? <laughs> this violent dude who came to kill and arrest people done reversed? He's not Saul the persecutor anymore. He saw the preacher of the, the same religion, the same sect, the same gospel, the one he was trying to arrest. He's preaching this heresy? They're what? Like, what? And so they're all saying to themselves, isn't this man, isn't Saul the one who was wreaking havoc in Jerusalem among those who said they was Jesus' followers? Didn't he come here to take them prisoners to the chief priests? He was just laying waste and destroying people. And they're, they're just, they can't even get with it. That suddenly now he done reversed. And then it says Saul grew more and more powerful. And the Jews was just more and more confused and baffled by this man. The Jews in Damascus are just like, what? Okay, I don't, I, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot understand what is happening. But I love it because it says he grew more and more powerful. His strength and power in Christ was progressive. It got more and more powerful, not just for him, but for me and you too. The more you do the will of God, the stronger you become in it, and the more anointing or more power you have to do his will. You know how we, we, we sit and we're like, okay, I need to do the will of God, and Lord, give me the strength. And God is saying, do my will, and you get stronger. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen? So he's getting stronger and stronger because he knows this thing is real. People cannot doubt your experience. If you had the experience, they can't say you didn't have it. Mm -mm. They might say, I don't believe that Bible. But whatever experiences you have with God, no one can take them away from you. And no one can say you did not have them. So he's got this spiritual energy flowing through him now. And now he's in the synagogue teaching because he's got all this theological training from becoming a Pharisee, remember you had to know the scriptures. You had to know them from a child all the way up. You had to be able to recite them. You had to be able to interpret them. You had to be able to teach them to people. 
You had to be able to have studied under all the rabbis so that you can impart the teaching of the law of God, all the Old Testament stuff. You had to be able to teach it. So Saul got all that. Now he got the Holy Ghost. Mm. Ah, what a combination. When you got the learning and then you got the spirit, you cannot be stopped. Amen? No wonder they was baffled. Because now he could take what he knew and he could prove by their own testament, by their own Old Testament, their scriptures, that Jesus is God's son. That word prove, proving that Jesus is the Christ, means that you take things and you put it together in such a way that it's making a comparison that people can examine and see for themselves the evidence says this is true. This is what Paul is doing. He's taking what he knows, putting it together with what he has now found out about Christ, knitting it together so that it comes together in a cohesive way to explain to them, Jesus is God. He's the Messiah. He is the Son. I didn't know. Amen? Amen? Can you do that? Can you take what you know, put it together with the word of God, and share with somebody that Jesus is the Christ? Amen. Because you experienced him? That's proof. That is proof. And in reality, Jesus is the Messiah. He's our Messiah, too. And so, he was the biggest piece of artillery against the Christians in the Jewish camp and now it had turned on them. <coughs> Can you imagine? Y'all remember that movie The Cross and the Switchblade? That Nikki Cruz who was a gang leader in New York? You know? And the old country preacher came to, to New York City because God told him to come out of Pennsylvania and go to New York and preach to the gangs. And the gang leader got on his knees and received Jesus Christ, his name was Nicky Cruz. Mm -hmm. When they saw that, now, <laughs> you have to remember, this is a country preacher. The Lord said, get up, go to New York, and preach at the gangs. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know now. <laughs> Today, and God say, you better go preach to, you know, to these people to do this and this. But some of us would be like, okay, Lord, can I get a bulletproof vest? <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Something. But so, you don't know what God's going to do. All we can do is go obey. Amen? And God took this man who was their biggest piece of artillery and turned him around and made him a Christian. Amen? Amen. Okay. Acts chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. Somebody, 23 to 25. And after that many days were fulfilled... The Jews took counsel to kill him, but there, but they're lying, but they're lying. I'm sorry, but they're laying awake was known of Saul, and they watched the gate day and night <laughs> to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. <laughs> so, that's it. Yeah, you okay. went to opening the wall. Yeah, twenty five. Mm -hmm. So. He's converted. It's unique. It's different. Everybody ain't get converted like that. Mm -mm. Most folks just had the gospel preached and the Holy Spirit, you know, might have filled the room and their hearts were touched and they believed and they received and now they're good. So he had this unique conversion and, and, and he's so bold with what he's doing. He's so well known. Now the Jewish community are like, oh, okay, wait. We're going to have to take him out. You know, we're we going to have to uh, kill him. We're going to have to get rid of him. So now, I want to point out something. Verse 23 says, after many days had gone by. When Saul first got converted, he took some time and went to Arabia. You find that out in Galatians. More than likely... It's not here specifically, but he speaks of when he goes to Arabia right after he got converted. So after many days, more than likely, this is the point of he gets saved, he preaches in the synagogue, now he goes and spends some time in Arabia, comes back 
to Damascus. Because you have to read Galatians to know that he goes, he stays for three years, and then he comes back to Damascus. And when he comes back to Damascus, and this is probably when we get this part right here, they want to kill him, and they got to let him down in the box, and then he goes back. Then he goes to Jerusalem for the first time to meet them. Amen? Amen. Okay. He probably went to Arabia learning about God, spending time with God, because sometimes when God does something unique in your life, you need to get away and spend some alone time with God so you can get some clarity of what's happening in your life and what he wants you to do. So probably it, after this period, now he comes back and this is when he has this situation because he comes back, you figure probably even stronger than ever. Preaching and teaching and causing all this commotion in Damascus. And he's been secluded, he's even stronger. Now this storm that he's got brewing because of who he is is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so they decide we're going to have to kill this man or get him out of here. And so day and night, they're keeping a watch. Now, isn't this amazing? He came to kill Christians, and now huh, they want to kill him. Ain't that something? Boy, you reap what you sow, don't you? <laughs> Good or bad. <laughs> You'll get it back. you get it back. So Saul learns of their plan. He finds out that they want to kill him because there's always somebody to come and let you know that somebody want to hurt you. You know so-and-so is talking about you. You know this is what they say. And you want to say, well, you was there and you just, <laughs> you just let him say it. You ain't had no defense from me or nothing. Oh, you just come back to tell me. <laughs> you know, beware. But anyway, Saul learned about their plan. And so day and night they are watching at the gates because they're expecting at some point for him to leave and, you know, go wherever he was going to go. Because he went to Arabia, now he's back. So they're thinking, whenever he gets ready to go out of these gates, we're going to take care of him. Because they didn't want to kill him inside the gates. You didn't kill nobody in the city in front of folks, right? But when people left the city and they're traveling on the roads, the roads could be dangerous. And that's when they were saying, we're going to take him out. But he found out about it. And because he found out about it, then he could make a plan to stay protected. Because you don't want to be taken out before God says it's time. You still got work to do. So you want to use wisdom. He didn't go and say, oh, they laying in wait for me, but God going to take care of me. I'm just going to go on out these gates anyway. And then you get shot and you say, well, I thought God was going to take care of me. Well, he told you about the plan. That was a part of the taking care. You didn't use wisdom. You just ran on out there all willy-nilly anyway. <laughs> Amen? So, I mean, there... The Jews was joining with the governor of Damascus, and he, he had given them, you know, probably some soldiers to watch over Paul, you know, to see Saul and see what he's doing so they could try to take him out with a government, you know, or a military situation going on. But it says, but, I like that word, but, because but means that what came before it is about to change to what's going to come after. His followers took him by night, it says, right? And they lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So his followers are aware, which means that he has some people now that are loyal to him. Can you imagine? He is preaching and teaching in such a way that now he has a following. He has people that care about him. He has people that are looking out for him. And that's what the church is about. We are to care for each other and look out for each other and take care of one another. Amen? Amen. I'm supposed to just let folks kill you and assassinate your character and you're my sister and my brother? No, you're not going to come and do that. Even if they say something you actually did do. You, that's still my sister. But you know how you'd be like, I can talk about you, but nobody else better not come talk about you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So it says they came up with a plan because they knew about the wicked plan and they took him by night. They was watching the gate but they letting him out the window in the back. 
And this was probably a basket, you know, maybe made, uh, made of um, ropes or something. But if you remember when we studied about the loaves and the fish, when they um, collected 12 baskets full, and we talked about how big these baskets were, mm -hmm. from the ground they were tall, mm -hmm. that's probably the kind of basket that Saul could get in so that they can lower him out of this window at night. So they, they made it by night, because remember we said that a lot of times the um, gates around the city were really, really wide and people had houses that were built up on the wall. Amen? Remember the Jericho wall that was really wide and um, Rahab the harlot, her house was up there? So these they were used to having wide, wide walls around the city. The gates were smaller, but the walls were wide. So probably one of the houses of someone, they got in and they let Saul down that way in that basket through the ropes. And he entered the city blind, but he left seeing in a basket. I love that. <laughs> Amen. So he had followers, which means he was already a good leader. He already had people that he was teaching about Jesus Christ. Okay. So verses 26 to 27, Acts 9, verses 26 to 27. Let's do that and then we're good. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him in. I mean, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Okay, so this is how we know that he's. This is he first now getting back to Jerusalem, because in another place or um, Saul says how he goes to Arabia uh, after his conversion. He does not go straight to the disciples, but now we find him going to the disciples. That's another indicator that he went to Arabia in the midst uh, of that situation. We got one verse, but there's a whole bunch of stuff jam-packed in there that occurred that's not in there, that Luke did not give us. Paul gives it to us himself later on. So now he's going back, to, he, 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 he escapes, he gets to Jerusalem, and he tries to join the disciples. He tries to join the church. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know the church sometimes, you know. Hold on. You know, wait. Ain't you the one that used to be on the corner? Now you suddenly trying to, you know, you know we be having one our clothes. <laughs> it says he tried to join them. He sought out his brothers. But they was afraid that his conversion wasn't real. They, they don't believe it. I mean, because the last time they saw him, whether it was three years ago or not, he was a Pharisee among Pharisees going to kill Christians. And now you back here talking about, I'm trying to join the church? He, 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 he's distrusted. And, and, and by, by the church, and of course the Pharisees probably thought he was a renegade and a, you know, a traitor. He didn't have nowhere to go. They were all scared of him. You know, they, they, he was an enemy of Christianity and Christ when he left. You know? But God's grace is what took him and did a new thing. And, but they ain't know all that stuff. You know, maybe Ananias sent some word back. And, and even if Ananias did tell them, they might not have believed it. Mm. <laughs> okay, I believe it when I see it, you know? So, but... Verse 27 says, Barnabas, you got to have somebody. You need a Barnabas. You need a son of encouragement. You need an encourager. You need somebody who is a builder and an edifier of others in your life. He took him. He saw the situation, and he becomes a friend and a brother to Saul, just like Ananias was in Damascus. God spoke to Ananias. I don't know if God spoke to Barnabas or not, or it was just his character to be an encourager of people and to love people. You know, it, that, that could have been the case because his name meant encourager, son of encouragement, right? He listened probably to Saul's story, and he believed him. He had insight and discernment, I think, because you need discernment. 
to let you know when folks is telling the truth. And he's convinced that Saul has been changed and transformed by Jesus Christ, that his heart has been changed, and he recognizes what an influence Saul can be for the church. When you get somebody who was a killer and they get saved, boy, they reaching some folks that me and you, some of us, is never going to reach. Amen? And, and, and it's, it's a crucial moment in Saul's life because he needed that Barnabas because where was he going to go? He was just going to be an outcast in both worlds without that Barnabas. Let's seek to be that. Amen? And he needs to have an introduction to Peter and to James and to the other pillars in the church because now he's had an encounter with Jesus just like they did but they just don't know his full story yet so we're going to stop there because it's a couple minutes before the end we're going to stop right there amen, amen. questions, thoughts, concerns no? wonderful come on let's pray <laughs>